Hey everybody, welcome to North Coast Church. Thank you so much for deciding to join us today. My name is Trent Jenkins. And I'm Kara Mabry. We are two of your pastors around here at North Coast Church. And Kara in particular is our communications pastor. I thought I'd bring her out here today to be able to help us understand how do we get a little bit more connected with North Coast or find out more information. So Kara? Yeah, Trent, the easiest way is through our digital bulletin. The digital bulletin is on our homepage at northcoastchurch.com, but it's also in the app. And everything for your local campus can be found in there from summer camps to summer events. Uh, But my favorite piece is the connection card. It's where we actually get to connect with you. You can fill that out each and every week, submit a prayer request, a comment, let us know what God is doing in your life. Special shout out to those in Washington. Thanks for submitting your connection cards. I read them, I'm praying for you. Now everybody's gonna be jealous around the country. They got a shout out. But I just goes to prove that we do follow these connection cards and we're reading over them. We're praying over those prayer requests. They're not just out there somewhere in the cloud. We really do wanna be able to connect with you. Let's go ahead and get ready for today's message. If you're a weekly watcher, you know what to do. We encourage you to download the message notes each and every week, or you can use our North Coast Church app and fill it out digitally. You can also give online or put in your prayer request. Uh, If you feel more comfortable, you can text in that prayer request or any questions you may have by using this phone number right here on the screen. And like we do each and every week, we're gonna enter into a time of worship to center our hearts and minds as we prepare to hear from God through scripture. So let's go ahead and join the band.
And I won't bow to idols I'll stand strong and worship you If it puts me through the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too I won't be formed by feelings I hold fast to what is true And if the cross brings transformation You can hang me there with you Cause death is just a toy to resurrection life If I join you in suffering Then I'll join you when you rise And when you return in glory all the angels and the saints My heart will still be singing My soul will be saved Christ be magnified So it was going to be a big road trip. My mom and dad were getting us all ready. Everything had to be packed. We were going to all load into the van. We were going to drive all the way down to Florida. My older brother was a teenager at the time. I was about eight or nine. And my older brother had just gone through boot camp in the summer, not for military, but for a missions. I think it was called teen missions at that time. And then he was going to be sent to Papua New Guinea for four or five weeks. They were supposed to build a runway. We were going to drive to Florida and see him before he left on this mission trip. So my mom had everything planned, what had to be packed, what we're doing, we're taking everything. And I had one job and she had told me weeks before, you got to find a turtle sitter. That's right, a turtle sitter. Um, Turtles have always been my favorite animal. I've always loved turtles. And growing up, I usually had a turtle or two or three or four. And even as a young adult in marriage, I had a big turtle tank in our living room. And at this time, I had this little red-eared slider, this little turtle, and he lived in this uh, aquarium in my room. And my mom kept telling me, someone's got to watch that turtle. We're going to be gone for almost two weeks. Someone's got to watch that turtle. Yeah, mom, I got it. Yeah. And every time she kept bugging me, I'm like, mom, I got it. I know I'm doing this. Well, this is the morning we're supposed to leave. Everything's packed in the van. I ran down in my room to get one more thing and I saw that turtle up on the rocks right next to the water in his little tank. And I realized I never got a turtle sitter. There's no way he's gonna stay in my room for two weeks. So I, I did what any eight, nine year old boy would do. I quickly got a cardboard box from the garage. I went outside. I pulled a bunch of grass. I put it in there. I got a Tupperware bowl from the kitchen. I filled it with water. I put one rock in there and I went out to our front porch, kind of over the garage, and I put that box out there. I got my turtle from the tank and I put him in it. So he's got grass. He's got a bowl of water. He's got a rock. I mean, he doesn't have food, but you and I both know I'm going to leave the top open so bugs can get in there. And it's just as if he was living outside and he'll be able to eat whatever flies in the box and then I'll put him back in the, I know you already got ahead of me, didn't you? We get back from that two week road trip. I'm taking stuff into my room. I'm putting my bags down. I see my turtle tank and I'm like, I gotta go see how he's doing. And I run up and I go out on that porch and in that cardboard box is this turtle stretched completely out up against the cardboard as fried and as stiff as dead as he could be. And this picture of him trying to get out of this prison that I put him in. And man, my heart just got ripped out of my chest. I couldn't believe I did this to my pet turtle. 
I was so distraught. I knew I'd be in so much trouble that I immediately went and I buried that turtle. Never told my parents what happened. Told them that whoever I loaned it to, that he died while they were watching him because I couldn't bear the extra grief and misery of telling them how I killed my pet turtle. I know you're thinking, what a depressing way to start a message. And yet I think that's what this message is about. We got one of those weird chapters today that's simply about knowing what you're supposed to do, knowing how to do it, and then it's just whether or not get it done. Just do it. Don't prolong it. Don't, pro don't keep going. Don't keep going. Don't keep get it done. And my bet is in your life and in my life today, North Coast, we are people that we know some stuff we should be doing. I know what I should be doing spiritually with God, but I'm just putting it up. And before you know it, man, we're killing the turtle. Whatever opportunity we had for life, whatever opportunity we had, well, it's 2 Samuel chapter 3. While you're opening your Bible, while you're turning there, while you're home, you're online, you're watching this, maybe in North County, maybe far away, get something to circle, highlight, underline. We're going to mark up this strange text. My bet is you're turning to 2 Samuel chapter 3 and you're realizing I've got nothing written down here. I haven't been here before. This is one of those chapters I've never heard it taught in my entire life. I've read this chapter before, but I've never taught this chapter in my entire life. It's one you just look and go, well, it's history of Israel, skip over it. So whether you've been in this mini series of Saul versus David and what's happening in the kingdoms of Israel at this time, or whether you're joining us for the first time, let me bring us all the date. We're gonna go to the board. I'm gonna draw a little bit here. Remind us where we've been, catch us all up. You're gonna hear names of characters and hopefully after I show you what a pathetic artist I am, you're gonna be able to go, oh, now I know the people and I know what's going on. So here's what's happening in Israel at the time. We've got two kingdoms. So we'll split it up kind of right, right through here and, and, and we'll do this with it. Okay, we've got a kingdom divided. This is Israel. On one side, we've got people that are vying for the throne. On one side, oh, how do you do a crown? I actually looked it up because I'm such a terrible artist. And even after looking it up, that's the best I can do for you. We, we've got King Saul. He was the first king of Israel. But here's the problem, as we've been reading, Saul is dead. Saul has sons, including Jonathan, and these sons are also dead. He's got one son left, and we've been reading about him for the last chapter and a half. His name is Ishbosheth, and we'll just call him Ish. Ishbosheth has been made king. Well, why is Ishbosheth king? Ishbosheth is king because of Abner. Abner is the guy that's in charge of the armies. I'm not about to do armies with my incredible skills here, but these numbers of men, the person that is the commander of that is Abner, and Abner was the cousin of the king. So he still wants power. Abner's control of the men, you're control of the army, but if you don't have a king, what, what good is being commander in chief? You're not chief of anything. So Abner's the one that put this son Ishbosheth on the throne so he can control him and Abner could keep his power. Now we've watched a change of hands in the last couple chapters. We watched this new king, the one that the prophet had anointed, David. And David is now making a play for the throne on this side of the equation. Oh, I gave him a bigger crown. Maybe that was theological. <laughs> And so David also now is wearing a crown over Israel. And it says that David has sons. We're got to get to the end of this chapter. He's got six sons, but they're all babies. They're all boys. But David also has an army. And the person that's leading David's army is his nephew, Joab. And Joab has a brother, Abishai. And they also have another brother, As a hell. And you can't make fun of him because he runs like a deer. But we found out in the last chapter, Asahel got killed in battle. So he's out of the picture. And you go, last chapter, what happened? Remember Abner? Abner wanted to show his force. Abner decided to make a little bit of a power play. And Abner took his troops and he marched them over to this territory just so they could see the power and might that this guy has. But in that skirmish, a little civil war broke out and Joab and his men chased Abner all the way back from whence they came and, and the battle wasn't even. These guys lost 360 men. These guys only lost 20 men. And what are they fighting over? They're fighting over God's people. They're fighting over Israel. But this is important for the chapter we're about to read. Israel now has one tribe that's following David. 
The 11 tribes of Israel, however, are following Ishbosheth and Abner. This is the land of Israel. This is what all the fighting is over. It's a battle for God's people. And now we're caught up on the story. Two kings, one nation. These guys have 11 tribes, but this one is anointed by God. David is supposed to be king. Saul is dead. He's lost his sons, but ish. David, we're gonna find out, has six, but they're babies, they're toddlers. They're not about to take the throne. And so Joab is the one fighting for this kingdom, for this reign. You got it, North Coast? We on? We all got the picture of what's happening? I'm gonna keep this on the board as I read. 2 Samuel chapter three. So the war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Oh, the tide is turning. They may only have the tribe of Judah for them. These guys got 11 tribes with them, but, but it's starting to tilt. The, the power of David is growing. The strength of David's house is growing. And when you go, how is that happening? Watch these next few verses. You see sons were born to David in Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon, the son of Ahinam of Jezreel. His second was Kiliab, the son of Abigail, the widow of Nabal in Carmel. The third was Absalom, the son of Maacah, daughter of Telmai, king of Geshur. The fourth was Adonijah, the son of Haggith. The fifth, Sheftai, the son of Abitel. And the sixth, Ethrium, the son of David's wife, Egla. These were born to David in Hebron. And during the war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner had been strengthening his own position in the house of Saul. Okay, this is where we have to take a little bit of a time out. One is an encouragement, one is a discouragement. One I love that it says the house of David is gaining strength. How, where, and it's because he has sons, because he has children. Oh, oh, parents, moms, dads, single parents, those that are raising grandkids, those of you that are in a parenting role, may I just encourage you, that is the most pivotal ministry you have right now. It's that raising of those kids. I love North Coast. I love the platform I've been given at North Coast. I love being able to be on staff here with this incredible team at North Coast. But I promise you, that does not compare to the position I have as dad of three, husband of one. See, when the house of David is growing in strength, it goes, let me tell you why, because you're raising up kids in this. Man, I just wanna encourage parents. Your strength is not found in the marketplace. Your strength is not found in the paycheck. Your strength is not found in the platform that you've been given. Your strength is not found in the work that you do. Your strength is gonna be found in the people that are in your circle. That is my legacy. Those are the ones that are gonna follow me. Those are the ones that are gonna look like me, gonna act like me. Those are the ones that are gonna carry on the faith tradition that Amy and I are trying so desperately to leave. Which brings us then to, wait, wait, wait a second. If I did the math, he's got six wives. When are we ever gonna talk about David taking wives? His, 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 his. Well, he doesn't have six. By the end of this chapter, he'll have seven. And if you know what's coming up, he's going to have eight. He's going to add Bathsheba to the mix of this well. Oh, plus he's going to have concubines. Well, how is his house growing in strength when he's got six wives and he's about to take number seven? And this is what we've been encouraging you all along. Sometimes we expect the Bible just to speak out and say, that's wrong. That's bad. We're against it. Here's move on. The Bible thinks you're actually going to read the Bible. The spirit of God thinks you're actually gonna devote yourself to the story. And if you know anything about David's story, and as we follow from this point on, I wanna say it now, this house is gonna become a train wreck. Even the sons that are mentioned here, his first in line is Amnon. Turn with me to 1 Amnon chapter three. 1 Amnon three. Oh, that's right, there is no 1 Amnon. Should have been. The son of King David? Where's his books? Where's his story? It's a page and a half. Because Amnon grew up in a house where he saw his dad with six wives, plus seven, plus Amnon was there when dad took his eighth wife, plus he saw his dad with concubines. Amnon decides to rape one of his half-sisters who live in the palace with him. Why? Well, he's trying to be like dad. Trying to be like dad. Dad doesn't do anything about it. He yells, but he doesn't do anything about it. 
Next son mentioned there, Absalom. Absalom's upset because dad doesn't do anything about it and Absalom kills Amnon. And then Absalom feels like I'm more of a man in the family because dad's not manning up. So Absalom decides to take dad's throne. And then Absalom decides to show everyone in the kingdom he's the new king. So he gets all of his dad's wives on the rooftop and he sleeps with them in front of everyone just to let everyone know, now I'm the king. These women are mine. Are you kidding me? Oh, it gets worse from there. Now we got Absalom that's chased out of the palace by David's men and David's men put a javelin through his heart. So David has lost a daughter that was raped. The son that raped her was killed by a son and that son is killed by David's warriors. We got Solomon and Adonijah looking at each other going, man, we thought we'd never get the crown. And Adonijah makes a play for it. He goes out in the city streets and he tells everyone, I should be king. I'm the man in the family. And to prove it, he takes one of his dad's wives, concubines, to be his. Solomon finds out about it and they kill him before he can do that. See, the Bible doesn't sit here and go, man, this is wrong. The Bible expects us to read it and go, watch what happens because of this. Deuteronomy 17, 17, write it down somewhere right here when it mentions the wives. Deuteronomy 17, 17, makes it clear, the kings of Israel cannot multiply wives. You do not take extra wives. Deuteronomy 17, 17. They should have known that because page two in the Bible, Genesis 2, 24, says, for this reason that there's male and female, the reason why there's two genders in creation is that man will leave his father and mother, cling to a wife, and those two will become one flesh. Page two of the Bible, the very end of the creation narrative says, this is God's design. One man, one woman, they unite and they become one flesh. Jesus in, in Mark chapter 10 says, therefore, what God has united, let no one ever separate. You don't separate one flesh. You don't sever one flesh. And so we have this picture that the Bible expects us to know. From the very beginning, God created one husband, one wife, one flesh. He specifically spelled out, you're a king, you're gonna think you can get away with more. You think you're gonna have more. Don't do this with possessions, don't do this with horses, and don't do this with wives but David's got six and the Bible expects you to read the next 19 chapters and go, oy vey, what a train wreck this turns out to be. The taking of multiple wives was not just forbidden. You will never find it as a blessing in the Bible. You will never find it as part of God's plan or condoned in the Bible. And just in case we get the wrong, I think, interpretation, the Bible says, let me list the names. Some of these sons we never hear from again. Either they died young or they amounted to be <laughs> so little of character and contribution, they're just never spoken of. The ones that are mentioned, we're gonna see, turn out to be tragedies. And God goes, but he did it. He did it, didn't he? Print it. Now, during the war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner had been strengthening his own position. Circle, highlight, underline, into verse six. His own position in the house of Saul. Now, Saul had a concubine named Rizpah, daughter of Ahiah. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, why did you sleep with my father's concubine? Now, we don't know if he did or didn't. Now we go back to David's got six wives. He's about to take seven at the end of this chapter and he's gonna take eight in uh, chapter 11. So that's David. Now the Bible turns the page and says, let's come back over here for a second. Ishbosheth, the king, confronts the commander of the army, the one that set him up to be king, Abner, and said, hey, why are you sleeping with my deceased father's concubines? Are you making a play for the throne? And the Bible doesn't say whether Abner did it or not. We've just got, we've just got a scandal in the palace. Captain of the guard is sleeping with the king's, deceased king's concubine. And in and, and Near East tradition, once you are a concubine or wife of the king, you are own property of the king. To have relations or to take that person is assuming some sort of power to the throne. It's also why in Egypt, a lot of times when there was a Pharaoh that died, all of his wives and concubines got entombed and buried with them. It was an ownership thing. Again, the Bible is not saying this is correct or this is right. It's just giving us a chapter in history saying, watch what happens here. Well, now Abner, 
was very angry because of what Ishbosheth said. And he answered, am I a dog's head on Judah's side? This very day, I am loyal to the house of your father, Saul, and to the family and friends. I haven't handed over to you, David, yet now you accuse me of an offense involving this woman. Oh, may God deal with Abner, be it ever so severely. If I do not do for David, here it goes, what the Lord promised him on oath. I swear, I'm gonna do for David, circle, highlight, underline, what the Lord promised him on oath. That's right. We said it last week, this entire time, Abner knows who's supposed to be king. Abner knows what God wants for Israel. Abner knows what God wants for his people. But Abner's been strengthening his own position. Abner's been looking out for himself. And by force, he's been trying to take what go, go against what God had planned. And now it's come to him and he realizes, I can't control Ish, the little puppet king that I put up. Oh, well, you're gonna face off with me? And I know this is gaining strength and I know we're getting weak. So Abner plays his cards. He's gonna take his 11 tribes and come over here and he's gonna try to make an alliance with David. I know right, right now you're doing the same thing I'm doing. I'm reading this going, this is why it was never taught to me. I don't know what in the world application is on this. This is why it was never taught to me. I don't know what to do with this. I lived in there for a couple days this week. So goodness, thank goodness, Thank the Lord's goodness for some great writers. I've mentioned to you before some of my main sources in this study. David Guzik from EnduringWord.com. Dale Ralph Davis, one of the best Bible commentary writers I've ever read. Charles Spurgeon in writing on this. Those were the things I leaned into to go, what is happening in this text? Why have I never heard this taught before? And why does it make no much, no much sense? Why is it not make much sense to me right now. Listen, North Coast Online, listen to me. Hang in with me. Let's finish the story. Then we'll come back and you and I will know how not to kill our turtles. Here we go. May God deal with me ever so severely if I do not do for David what the Lord promised him an oath. Verse 10, and I'm gonna transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and I'm gonna establish David's throne over Israel and Judah from Dan to Beersheba. Ishbosheth did not dare say any other word to Abner because he was afraid of him. Now Ishbosheth realized, I ticked off Abner. Abner's like, really? I can't control you? You're gonna do this to me after all I've done for you? All right, I'm gonna take our 11 tribes and I'm gonna go over and I'm gonna put in the one in the hands that God wants to have it anyway. So Abner sent messengers on his behalf and he said to David, whose land is it? Make an agreement with me and I will help you bring all of Israel over to you. <laughs> so Abner sent messengers and goes, hey, who owns all this? You want it? Talk to me. I'll come over and I'll make an agreement. Well, good, said David. I'll make an agreement with you, but I demand one thing of you. Do not come into my presence unless you bring Michael, daughter of Saul, when you come to me. Then David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, son of Saul, demanding, give me my wife, Michael, whom I betrothed myself for the price of a hundred Philistine foreskins. Man, it seems like a year ago we read that passage. Back when King Saul was alive, he promised that whoever goes out and kills Goliath can have one of his daughters in marriage. Whoever kills this giant, I will make rich. David does that and then some. And then King Saul wants to kill David because of his jealousy and says, well, I'm not, I'm not actually gonna give you my daughter, Michael. Uh, you have to go earn it for a, a hundred Philistine foreskins. And yet David went out and killed 200 men and brought back foreskins. You have to go back and I'm not about to repeat that story. Now David, some 10, 15 years later, says, you gotta bring me Michael. You got one, two, three, four, five, six. You got six wives. What do you want over here? I want Saul's daughter. I want lucky number seven. Oh, it's so romantic. His first love, maybe, but I don't think so. We don't find such love. We don't find really intimacy with David. Oh, we find a lot of sexuality, but not real intimacy from David. I think what's happening here is David just understanding, man, if Michael and I, if Saul's daughter and I can have a male child, does that unite the kingdom? Now I got a male offspring of the other king from me. Man, this makes us Israel. Bring me number seven. But she's been married to another guy for 10 years. And oh, I'm gonna tell you, this is one of the saddest scenes in the Bible. Ishbosheth gave orders and had her taken away from her husband, Paltiel, son of Laish. Her husband, however, went with her, weeping behind her all the way to Baharim. 
Then Abner said to him, go back home. And he had to turn around and go back home. So Ishbosheth goes and gets Saul's daughter, Michael, rips her from her home, her husband, and they start marching her to David. Her husband follows the entire journey, just crying, wailing, for the love of my life. You can't take her and give her to some other king. Finally, Abner, the captain of the guard, has to get in front of him, get back home. And the guy can't do anything against the army, but just return back home. Are you kidding me? This is why you and I constantly have to read the word of God as both descriptive and prescriptive. What is God doing here? Why did God want that to happen? No, 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 no. We got really crooked people fighting over the people of God. This isn't what God ordained. This isn't what God planned. God said, one husband, one wife. That's how we make strong families. Man, you raise up kids in your faith and your love for the Lord. That's how you're gonna grow in strength. Not what you make, not what you do, not what you earn, not your position, not your titles, your testimony. Who you are in Christ is who your kids are gonna follow. Man, that's what you pour into. Watch what happens when it goes awry. You got six wives, you got a rape in the house, you got three brothers murdered by brothers. It is ridiculous. And now dad wants number seven and you're breaking apart a family to do it. Don't read this as God's blessing or God ordaining anything. This is descriptive. We'll clear that up in a second. So Abner conferred with the elders of Israel and said, for some time you've wanted to make David your king. Chapter 18, now do it. Circle, highlight, underline. Put an asterisk by it. This is where we're camping out when we get done with this story. Now do it. You know God has wanted David as king. You've wanted to make David as your king. Now do it. No delay. For the Lord promised David, by my servant David, I will rescue my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Why am I going to do it? Why is there such urgency? Because there's a promise of God here that's going to bring salvation from the enemy. You know that God has promised that David is going to be the one that saves you from your enemy. Now do it. Isn't this ironic coming from Abner? The guy that's been opposing this, the guy that's been fighting this, but oh, now that's going to turn around and be good for him. Now he gets all spiritual. This is the promise of God to save us from our enemies. Let's do it. And you're like, you hypocrite. Man. Abner also spoke to the Benjamites in person. Then he went to Hebron to tell David everything that Israel and the whole house of Benjamin wanted to do. And when Abner, who had 20 men with him, came to David at Hebron, David prepared a, pe a feast for him and his men. Abner said to David, let me go at once and assemble all of Israel for my Lord, the king, so that they may make a compact with you, a treaty that you may rule over all of your heart desires. So David sent Abner away and he went, get this in peace, circle, highlight, underline. He gives him immunity. Abner comes to David once he sent messengers back and forth and they worked it out. Abner comes to David with only 20 men. He doesn't come with an army. Because he knows, hey, we're on each other's side. I can't get anything from this fake king anymore, so I'm going to get a great position in your army. I can get a prize in your army. I can get my power, my prestige, my preferences from your army. By the way, this is what God had promised, and God wants salvation from our enemies. Let's do it. And Abner already shows us. He's the type of guy that only uses scripture when it suits him. He's the type of guy that only uses scripture when it suits him, not out of his love for God, not out of his surrender, but this works for me at this time. You know why? Because I was doing it this way and it didn't work for me. And he only brings 20 men. Why? Because he comes and goes in peace. He has immunity. Okay, let's wrap this up, bring this thing home. Just then, David's men and Joab returned from a raid and brought with them a great deal of plunder. But Abner was no longer with David in Hebron because David sent him away and he had gone in peace. When Joab and all the soldiers with him arrived, he was told that Abner, son of Ner, had come to the king and that the king sent him away and that he had gone in peace. So Joab went to the king and said, what have you done? Look, Abner came to you. Why did you let him go? Now he is gone. You know, Abner, son of Ner, he came to deceive you and observe your movements and to find out everything you're doing. So Joab then left the king and he sent messengers after Abner. They brought him back from the well of Sarah and David didn't know it. 
And when Abner returned to Hebron, Joab, t- Joab took him aside into the gateway as though to speak with him privately. And there, to avenge the blood of his brother, Asahel, Joab stabbed him in the stomach and he died. Later, when David heard this, he said, I and my kingdom are forever innocent before the Lord concerning the blood of Abner, son of Ner. May his blood fall upon the head of Joab and upon all of his father's house. The, the rest of this is just a long memorial service, a funeral possession. You can jump to verse 36. All the people took note and were pleased. Indeed, everything the king did pleased them. So on that day, all the people of Israel and all of Israel knew that the king had no part in the murder of Abner, son of Ner. Abner comes over with his 20 men. Can we shake on it? Shake on it. I'm going to give you 11 of these things. Let me go back and tell the men, this is what God wants. You got it. Now you have all 12 tribes. We got a kingdom. He heads back home. Joab returns with the men from raiding. Should be a celebration, ticker tape parade. We routed our enemies. We brought back some plunder, but no, he hears, hey, you just missed Abner. Abner, the dude last chapter that killed my brother, Asahel? Yeah, 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 Abner was just here. What happened? He's made a treaty. He's gonna unite Israel with David. Are you kidding me? And the commander of the army goes into his king. He was here spying. He's treacherous. You can't trust him. And David's like, you don't understand. We got this thing sorted out. So Joab goes out and says, call him back. Now remember, he's got immunity. Remember, he comes and goes in peace. So Abner's not expecting anything. Abner turns around at the well. They were at a little rest stop on their way out of town. They came back. Joab meets him now. Said, hey, let's just talk about how we're going to work out the details. Goes out in the breezeway. (laughs) King David hears about it and is like, are you kidding me? This was done under my authority. He had immunity. And David has a public memorial service proclaiming he had nothing to do with this and we're gonna honor Abner. And Israel goes, we like the way this guy leads. Sorry, Ish. 12 tribes now are gonna for the first time be united under David. Okay, you're still wondering about the turtle and you're still wondering what do I do with my life in this? And those are really good questions because that's what I was wondering after reading this three times, but thank goodness for some great, brilliant writers who helped me look at this thing in a different perspective. And then I realized, I think we need a picture. I think we need to draw this thing out just to understand who is doing what and why. I didn't realize how much I would be erasing. Yes, check out the bald spot. And as we get into this then, am I all good? If not all good, the guys will tell me. Here's what I want you to do. Take out your note sheet. What do we do with this story? What do we do with this story? Here's where I think the beauty of the story comes. Because you look at the characters and go, well, who are we supposed to be like? See, that's the problem. I think we always look at the characters and go, well, who are we supposed to be like? I guess in this story I should be, what are my choices? Abner? No. Joab? No. David? I guess that's the best. I, I guess we should be like David? No. No, no, no. We're missing the character of the story again. We're missing the hero of the story. The hero of the story is a God that says the kingdom is coming. It's your title. Circle, highlight, underline is on your own note sheet. The kingdom is coming. It's God saying, I don't have a perfect person to work with. I got a bunch of jacked up people in this. I want to work through Ishbosheth. No. I want to work through Joab. No. Is David doing the right thing? No, not at all. David's sons? Nope. They're not going to go down that track either. What about Michael? She's an innocent victim in this whole thing. Her husband's just in tears because they got ripped apart. We got no one to root for in this story, but we do. We step back and realize this is God saying, my plan, my promise is happening. Even with jacked up characters who are going to have huge consequences. Watch what God is doing. God made a promise to Abraham way back at the beginning of this book. Leave your people, follow me out of all the nations. I'm going to make you a great one. He then told Israel under Moses, follow me. Remember what I did. Remember how I saved you. If then you want to surrender and follow me, then out of all nations, you're going to be my treasured possession. We got a covenant given to Abraham. We got promises given to Moses. We got a promise given to David. You're going to set up a kingdom for me from the house and line of Judah. From this, I'm going to bring this Messiah. This is God saying, 
You can't stop it. You can't get in the way. You can fight it. You can choose to jump in or choose to jump out. It doesn't matter. This train has left the station. The kingdom is coming. God's plan is working. I'll write you the chapters. I'll give you the description of what these bozos did in the midst of it, but you can't stop the plan of God from happening. You can't. Even when you know the plan of God, then you have to come back and go, will I do it? (laughs) Just look at the characters. Write this down. A closer look at the characters. Abner, what's he do? He resists it by force. This is what Abner does. The kingdom is coming. So what role are we playing? The kingdom is coming. I love the way Jesus, when he walked around the Sea of Galilee, he would tell people the, the kingdom of God is near. Well, how, how near? Well, Chris has been 2,000 years. It wasn't that near. No, the kingdom of God is both then and now. What is a kingdom? Wherever someone has complete rule and reign, wherever they are sovereign, that is their kingdom. That's what Jesus was saying. The kingdom of God is near. His next lines are what? Mark chapter one, repent and believe. Confess how you're living and what you're doing and believe that he's Lord, make him Lord. That begins the kingdom of God. People, the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of Jesus in your life is near. How near? What day? What time? Today. Today. Today? Yeah. The promise of God. And then I love the words of Abner. Now just do it. Surrender. Let the rule and reign of Christ be in your life. Let let your life be his kingdom. Abner, what's he do? He resists it by force. Let's look at second Abner because last chapter, Abner, remember, had the arrow. He came in with his troops. He tried to resist the kingdom. He got beat. He got beat out 360 to 20. He lost 360 men to David's 20 men. All right, if he can't resist it by force, what do you do? Abner now in chapter three, he's in it for the wrong reasons. Abner's in it for the wrong reasons. Abner sought to strengthen his own position. This is where you and I get to look at the character and say, where am I? God's rule and reign in your life. Your life surrendered to God. Are you resisting it? Are you fighting it? Are those things like Abner, you know what God wants you to do. You know there's areas you're not right in, but you are resisting it with all you have. Why? We love our premarital sex. I have great reasons for living together outside of the, 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 the boundaries, the guidelines of marriage. We, 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 we cut our finances and we do so much shady things. Why? It benefits me. It strengthens my own position. This is Abner. I know what the plan of God is. I'm gonna fight against it. I don't want that. Why? Because I wanna wear the crown. I wanna be king of this. Man, I hate tapping out. I hate surrendering. I hate that someone else is in control of me. Even if that's God, even if that's creator, Oh, shouldn't you rejoice, wake up every day and say, oh, please be in control of this. Oh, please take this wherever you want. Oh, please use this however you want to use this. And then sometimes we realize, all right, I can't fight this thing. What's in it for me? How do I strengthen my own position on this? We see Joab in the scene. What is Joab doing? Joab, he's only concerned for his kingdom. That's what Joab's doing. But didn't, didn't he go and he killed his brother? Out of revenge, he killed Abner because Abner killed his brother. Abner killed his brother in battle. There should have been no personal revenge for a public battle. Be, be, be very, very cautious of people who in public battles take on personal revenge. And this is Joab. But what's his real motive? He sees what's happening. He goes to King David and David's like, hey, we just made a treaty with Abner. We got all 12 tribes. Joab should have been, whoa. We got the whole kingdom? No. Joab's like, you can't trust that guy. He's in it for himself. You can't trust that guy. He's got his ways. He's triangulating us here. You can't trust that guy. You can't. He's out here scoping out our positions. What's Joab's problem? Yeah, he's afraid you can't have two commanders. Joab realizes, whoa, 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 whoa. What's Abner going to get? This is mine. I've been fighting for this. This is, this is mine. What is Abner going to get? See, Joab is just concerned for his kingdom. You and I do this so often when we go, okay, Jesus is Lord, God, but our prayers, our desire in following him is for our kingdom, not his kingdom. See, Abner and and Joab, I wrote this down. They show us the difference between believing it and living it. That's what they do. 
Abner knows David is supposed to be king. Abner knows David is the anointed one. He knows it. He believes it, but he doesn't want to live it. Joab knows the hand of God is at work in this kingdom. He believes it, but he doesn't want to live it because of what it may cost him. James chapter two says, this is called demon faith. James says, show me your faith. Show me your faith. Don't tell me your belief. Because some may say, well, I believe. And James goes, good. Don't the demons believe in God? And they're afraid of him. North Coast, I say this before because I think it is so fundamental for our understanding of whether or not we're children of God. Hear this. The reason why I say this every several months at least is because I don't want North Coasters online or in present to ever be in a Matthew 7, where people come to Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we pray to you? Didn't we sing songs to you? Didn't we call out to you in your name? And he goes, depart from me. I never knew you. What do you mean we're not in the kingdom? What what do you mean? We went to church. We went to life group. We did all this. And he goes, I didn't know you. There was no lordship. There was no surrender. What did you have? You had belief. And James in chapter two says the demons believe. The demons know Jesus is the son of God. The demons know Jesus came to earth. The demons know what Jesus taught and the miracles he did. The demons know Jesus died on the cross for sin. The demons know he raised himself from the dead. Please tell me your faith is more than demon faith. Please tell me it's more than belief. You believe Jesus is the son of God. You believe he came to earth. You believe he taught, did miracles. You believe he died on the cross and rose again. And James goes, that's what demons know. Where's your faith? Show me your faith. Well, I thought it was in believing. No, no, no. Abner believed David was supposed to be king. Abner believed David was supposed to be anointed. He knew it all the time. He didn't act on it, but he knew it. Joab knows that David is anointed. He's been with him since he was a little kid. Joab knows this is the hand of God, but he's not going to act on that. He's going to act on his own self-preservation. What's the difference then between the demon's belief and a Christian's belief? Demonstration. (laughs) <laughs> demonstration. It's surrender. I demonstrate that belief in how I surrender. What is the difference between a demon faith in who Jesus is and your faith? Surrender. Demons don't surrender. Demons don't bow a knee. The demons know more about Jesus Christ being son of God, dying on the cross and rising again than I do and than you do. Please, North Coast, understand the belief in Jesus is not salvation. There's surrender that needs to accompany that. I not only believe he is Lord, I'm living that. I've surrendered to it. I put my faith in that belief that he's the son of God who died for me and rose for me. These two guys know the promise of God, the hand of God. They believe it with all their heart and mind and they refuse to live it. (laughs) It's the words of Abner. This is God's plan for salvation. And then when he gets in a jam, he comes to the 11 tribes. Now do it. Let's not delay anymore. Now do it. But we see his motives are about himself. What do we have in David in this? David is just sinful obedience. Sinful obedience. Oh, shoot. That should be sinful disobedience. Nope. That should be uh, holy obedience. Nope. That, mm, these two words shouldn't go together. <laughs> they shouldn't go together. What's David's role in this? Well, he's got a lot better. I mean, he's better than where he was four chapters ago. We got to give him that. David's taking seven wives and having six sons. Three chapters ago, David was killing wives and sons. He's getting better. He's on the track. But here's the problem with David. This is going to be his Achilles heel. Women are always going to be his Achilles heel. He's going to train work his family in this. He's going to get to number eight. He's going to take the wife of a neighbor after he sleeps with her and gets her pregnant. And then he kills her husband to cover it up. Oh, people, this thing's about to take off. This whole what's going on behind the kingdom and God showing, let me tell you, I have a plan and this is how I want you to live. Do not confuse how David is living for what I want from you. Look at these characters and see that God is still bringing an answer, a redeemer in spite of characters. But look at the consequences of life. David is walking in sinful obedience. Write it down this way. There is a huge difference between selective obedience and surrendered obedience. There is a huge difference between selective obedience and surrendered. Selective obedience is when I'm obeying God except for some of these areas because I got my reasons. 
I got my reasons. I, I, there's no way I can be a pastor that truly loves you and teaches the word of God and not teach this. I know why you're living together. I know it makes sense. I know it makes sense for the kids, financially, medically, all this. You got all your reasons, but go, but there's a way to do this in surrender and obedience. You're living in disobedience and it's now selective obedience. But Chris, we're doing this. I just have this. And I go, and that's what's going to kill you. See, culturally, it was appropriate for kings to take a lot of wives. So no one had an issue with the Old Testament. No one had an issue with these guys that once you reach an amount of success, you take multiple wives. It's all over the Bible. Why? Because culturally, it was accepted. Nowhere is it pointed out as a good idea. God clearly says from page two on, one wife, one husband. Let me write the stories of these guys. We expect after every time it's mentioned, David had six wives. Therefore, God beat him six times every night with a whip before he gave up five. We expect that to be there. We expect the Bible to be far more harsh than it is. And God goes, no, I told you in page two what marriage is. I backed it up when I wrote the Kings in Deuteronomy 17. You don't multiply wives and I'm just gonna write it. And I think you're smart enough to read the next chapters and figure out, wow, there's consequences for that. We look at these chapters, why, why doesn't God say it's right? Why doesn't God say it's wrong? Why is he? And God's, God says, look, I expect you're reading the word, not a chapter. Watch where this thing goes. See, we also have culturally acceptable sins. These are the things, and this is where I go to the men, you know what to do, now do it. I knew for two weeks, someone had to watch that turtle. For two weeks, that turtle had to be taken care of. They kept at Christian, yeah, I know, mom. Yeah, I got it taken, yeah, I got it. Mom, I got it all taken care of, all right, fine. And then I get to the day of and realize I don't have the same taken care of. I'm gonna take care of it myself. And what do I do? I kill my stinking pet, fried the turtle to the side of a cardboard box. <laughs> why? I know what to do. I know why I had to do it. I just didn't do it. These are culturally acceptable sins. The spirit of God tells us, oh, that's not right. But we go, yeah, 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 but, but what? But our, I just wrote down a list of these premarital sex, pornography, living together, our financial shortcuts, not declaring everything we need to declare, drunkenness, getting high. Oh, but that's legal now. I always got people go, well, that's legal now. So is adultery. So I, I guess that's open season. God, our obedience is what God's word says, not what's legal or illegal. Pride, gossip, materialism, the retail therapy that we need to go to just to appease what's broken in our life. We have all these culturally acceptable sins. And this is exactly where David is. And there's a huge difference between selective obedience and surrender. Surrender is when I come and say, God, there's some of these I don't like. There's some of these I don't agree with. But because I, my belief is more than demons, it's surrendered God, I yield to you in areas I don't like. I yield to you in areas I disagree with because I have a hunch you're smarter than me. And even if I think I'm smarter than you, it's my surrender that shows lordship and faith, not belief. It's my surrender. Where are you surrendering the things that you disagree with? Where are you the surrendering the things that you know what you should be doing? I know what God's plan is. I know what it is, but man, I'm fighting it or I'm going against it or I'm just trying to strengthen my own position. Man, I just got to encourage you. In the words of Abner, just do it. Just do it. You know what the plan of God is. Stop delaying, just do it. You see, we can never confuse God's patience with us for his pleasure with us. And I think that's what helps our sinful obedience, which is disobedience. It's disobedience. But what promotes it is God's patience with us. We have confused and mistaken it for God's pleasure with us because God doesn't whip me every night because life is still going good, because I still got the crown, because we're growing in strength, because things are taken off good financially. Therefore, God must be happy with my six wives. I think I'll take number seven. And then I think I'll take number eight. See, we confuse God's patience, God's grace, God holding back his wrath as it must be okay, must not be a big deal. Things are going well for me. And I think that's what this chapter is about. God says, no, no, things are going well because the kingdom is coming in spite of you. 
God has a plan in spite of you. North Coast, I just want to encourage you. Is today the day? Is today the day you know what you've been avoiding? You know what you may be resisting by force. You know what you've been doing just on your own and keeping this to the side. And today's the day you're going to knock it off. <laughs> There had to be a, to a point where I said, I'm going to do this or I'm just going to kill the turtle. And because I delayed, 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 it was finally too late. And I killed that little animal. Our spiritual life is the same way. God doesn't have his pleasure with what you're doing. He's not condoning it. He simply has patience saying, you better get it done. Yeah, 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 I know. No, seriously, but yeah, 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 I know. You better, I got it taken care of. Okay, okay but this is gonna kill you. Read the story. It doesn't take much to connect the dots. David, this is gonna destroy you. It just will. Sin has a purpose in your life and my life. So here's how I wanna close. There's some of you that we've been doing this for the last few weeks about these two forces, two kingdoms fighting for the people of God. You know who Jesus is, you believe who Jesus is, but you've never surrendered. You've got demon faith a belief that Jesus, the son of God, came to earth, taught, did miracles, died on the cross and rose again. Demons have all of that knowledge. They believe it. I don't think they're going to heaven. The difference is surrender. Have you surrendered to it? There's a plan of God to save us from enemy and to save us from our sin. We resist it. We try to find out just the, the verses that fit us and the ones that don't. And that's not surrender. And God wants surrender, surrender. For you longtime Christian, there may be something in your life right now and you know exactly what it is. You hate these messages because you don't want to give up on it. It makes you feel good. It works for you. It's what you're leaning on right now. And I promise you, don't confuse that for God's pleasure to confess it. I'm not gonna lead you in a prayer. Christian, you know, confess it, lay it down. As we looked last week, walk away from this and ask God's power and might to forgive you and give you the strength to leave it. For those of you though that said, you know what, Chris, I've never surrendered. I know who Jesus is. I believe it, but I think I got demon faith. I have not surrendered to the word of God, the will of God, the kingdom of God, his rule, his reign. I've not surrendered to it in my life. It's near, but it's not here. If that's you, can I just lead you through a prayer right now? Wherever you're watching, wherever you're sitting, whether you're alone by yourself, with family, in a living room, doing this as a group right now. If you want to surrender for the first time, give your life back to Christ. Other Christians right now are doing their own prayer of repentance, forgiveness, get rid of whatever's killing your life. But for you, it's your first time. Can you just say this? Just between you and God, your heart, your mind to him. God, thanks for allowing me to hear this today. You know I needed this. I believed in you, but I haven't surrendered. I've been living life my way. There's a lot of things I'm holding out on. And today I wanna to say I'm sorry for living my life my way, not your way. I do realize that you sent your son to die on the cross for me, that something needed to be done for the payment for my sin, my disobedience, and that God, you took it out on your son. Today I wanna to thank you for that. I'm sorry you had to do that, but I pray by accepting that payment for my sin, that you would forgive me. You would bought me today, buy me, make me yours. I believe Jesus rose again so that his spirit can live in us. And today I accept that. I ask you to come into my life. Teach me how much you love me so I can learn to love you. Teach me how to surrender all of my ways to your will and your ways. From this day on, I'm yours. Hey, we would love to know that. If you said that prayer for the first time, I know it's tough online, but man, our staff, our team, this is why we exist, would be so encouraged. Can you just use electronically, digitally, can you just get on your note sheet there in your communication card and said, I said that prayer today? We would just love to know that and be praying for you. Maybe you said a prayer of repentance today. You don't have to tell us what it's about, but we would love to hear from you as well. Just saying, I said a prayer to repent today. Pray for me as I walk away from what I need to walk away from. I promise our team will be praying for you this week. We love you guys. North Coast Online, thanks for joining us. Another great message as we are continuing in the series on David. 
and another way for us to be able to apply God's word to our lives. Absolutely, Trent. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next week.